tonight we've got uh, the carol service and uh, I don't know if it's a positive or negative but Danny's bringing his band and me and Ian's been given our P45s. So that might be a good thing or it might be a bad thing, depends which way you look at it. So we're, we're bringing in the experts tonight. So just to keep that in mind, let's just pray, shall we? Emily Farber, I thank you, Lord, that you are so awesome. And Lord, as the world focuses in on Christmas, Lord, help us to keep focusing on you. Lord, when the world, world gets silly, Lord, help us to focus in and you'll be off from the effect of our faith. Lord, that we may just continue to trust in you through this season, remembering the why behind what's going on. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. So if you've got a Bible, if you want to um, turn... I'm going to be jumping around a little bit. Has anybody got a Bible? Do you want to wave your Bibles at me? We have a few, that's good. If you've got a phone or another device, uh, I'm not going to give you the... Wi-Fi account, you can't do eBay. So anyway, Christmas is one of those weird times when it seems to, people drop into several categories. Sometimes it gets a bit weird for some people. Other people, they get very serious and very religious. And I thought this morning, I'd just unpack a little bit about Christmas. So I don't want to shoot anybody's sacred cows, but there's more traditions about Christmas that are man-made than actually Christmas itself is what it's really about. Now, as a, I think, personally, I think the Catholic Church makes too much out of Mary, but I think the Protestant Church do not make enough out of Mary. It's kind of like we ignore her completely, where other groups make way too much out of her. So, the fact is, Jesus needed a, a mother, and Mary just happened to be the one that God chose, which I think is a pretty good thing because she was a great girl, a great lady, and she turned out to be an awesome woman as well. I mean, imagine, imagine the scene of the toddler group when Mary takes Jesus to the toddler group and everybody's saying how good their child is. I mean, little Johnny's over there, he's, you know, he's been walking since he was three weeks old and he's awesome. And there's little Billy there who can now build a, ch a chair and a table at the age of two. And Mary sat there going, yeah, but my kid's God. But she couldn't say that. She couldn't say it. And then on the other side of that, you've got the other children that Mary had asking the question, well, why don't Jesus get into trouble? Because he's God, all right? Imagine Mary just throwing him out. But she kept it into her heart. She kept it close to her. So if you've got a Bible, I'm, going to, I'm not going to read in Luke. I'm going to turn, first of all, to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 25. But if you want to look at the, the whole of the Christmas story, it jumps between two Gospels. Well, actually, it's three Gospels, but John's Gospel says in the beginning was the Word. So his genealogy goes right back to the beginning of creation. And, but when it comes to the earth, John just jumps straight in and Mark jumps in. But Luke and Matthew would give a little bit of an insight. So if you stay in Matthew, but in Luke chapter 1 is when you have the birth of Jesus being foretold, when the, the angel of the Lord came to Mary and it scared her, but she says, Be unto you as the Lord has said, let it be unto me. And then in Matthew, so you've got the, the angel appearing to Mary, and then in Matthew you've got the story, or the part of the story, verse 18, of the birth of Christ, it says. And reading from verse 18, it says this, This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, you need to, if you've ever got people who think Mary didn't have any other kids and kept a virgin, uh, it does say before they came together, and that doesn't mean just got married, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Joseph really loved this girl and he didn't want it to become a real problem for her, knowing that it would become a big issue. So he tried to, he wanted to do it quietly. I mean, at the end of the day, guys, if you're in that similar situation, it may have, I mean, an angel's going to appear to him. And in some cases, it had taken an angel to appear to us. If our wife or girlfriend or our engaged person had said, they're with child. 
There's only been one immaculate conception, so if that occurs again, there's a problem. But verse 20 says this, After he'd considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home to be your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you have to give him the name Jesus, because, and underline this a little bit, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what was written from a prophet. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He took Mary home to be his wife, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and they gave him the name Jesus. We sometimes rush through the whole nativity scene and, and tonight and maybe next week we're, we're going to do a little bit on what happened with, with the whole nativity. But when we, we've got over the years a picture in our head of what happened on the 25th of December 2018 years ago. Well, actually, Jesus wasn't born 2018 years ago because they, they kind of messed up the calendar. He was probably born maybe three years before, years before uh, BC to AD. That's just, they know that, they're aware of that. And Jesus probably wasn't born in December because later on we read about the shepherds, wash it was actually um, out there with the shepherds. Sorry, the shepherds were out there with sheep and they didn't do that in winter. The chances are she might have conceived in December, so we're pretty close to that bit. Nine months, September. It's nearly Christmas, guys, come on. Oh, don't make me get silly. We've had that this morning already, haven't we? So Jesus was probably born, probably in maybe September time. Given or take a little bit. Given the fact that we needed the sheep out there to have the lambs so that in April time, our, our calendar, they would be sacrificing all the sheep at the Passover. That's the way it all went. So you've got all these, these shepherds then that turn up later on. And then after the shepherds, so you've got to jump back into Luke to find the shepherds. Then you jump back into Matthew to find the wise men. You know, the wise men didn't come at the same time as the shepherds. It probably wasn't in a stable traditionally like with wood around it because there wasn't much wood in, in Jerusalem and Israel at that time so they would often have caves. So it was probably a cave and Jesus' parents were not poor, poor and totally skinned because we read there was no room in the inn. How did they know there was no room in the inn? Because they'd gone to the door with the credit card and said, is there any room? And they said, there's no room. However, being a good, <laughs> savvy Jewish person says, I'll rent you the stable round the back for half price. Or something like that. It wasn't a case that Joseph and Mary turned up in their rags and in ruins and just thought, we're totally desolate. And the question is, why, if he's a descendant of Boaz, You'll have to track that right to the back of the book of Ruth. He was a descendant of Boaz, and Boaz was a very wealthy person because he owned a lot of land. And we don't know why Joseph ended up in Nazareth, but it's what God wanted. But he actually would have had an ownership in Bethlehem, and that's why he went. He had property in Bethlehem. That's why he had to go back there in the census so he could be taxed. This guy, you know, it's like, I won't get to the political parties on this, and we'll leave it at that. But they went there, and then sometime later, Jesus was born, and, and sometime later they took him to the temple. This could was 30 days or so later. Took him to the temple, we read about Simeon being there and blessing the child, and there's a prophetess there that, that gets in on the act. And then after that, then we have the wise men turning up. And if we read about the wise men, they went into Jerusalem and came to King Herod, and then Herod did a search and said it's in Bethlehem. And then Herod secretly called the Magi together, the wise men. They weren't kings, that's just a song. They brought them together and said, go find him, and when you find him, report to me. And it says this in verse uh, 9 of Matthew 2. It says, after they had heard the king and went on their way, the star that they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was, 
When they saw the star, they were of joy. Coming to the house, they, next page, saw the child and his mother. We miss the fact that they came to the house. Yeah. They came to the house. They did not come to the stable. There's no donkey in the nativity. Little donkey, little donkey is non-existent. So they came to the house, and this was after they'd done all the stuff. So Joseph had gone from the idea of being in a stable because something because he was so poor and desolate, but now he's in the house, so he's, he's renting the house, or he's bought the house, or it's his house. He, he, you know, most people don't actually realize that Jesus, when he'd grown up, had a house. I think he just lived on hand house. He actually had a house, but that's a, that's a story for another time. So anyway, so these guys in, uh, which story I'm in here? Uh, we've read that one. No, I better read some, I've read Matthew to you. Sorry, my head's all over the place. Yes. Did I read Matthew to you? Yes, that's okay. It's only David yet. We're going with that one. And then we're into the, the whole story. And you can read it, to you, to read it yourself. But you've got to ask the question. When the wise men came, they sought out Jesus. See, we don't kind of put two and two together. But if you jump, and I'm saying this because you guys, are, um, you're all up to speed on a lot of these things. If you go back to the book of Daniel, you know, Daniel in the lion's den, he was put in charge of the Magi's, which word means in Hebrew, it means the magistrates. He was put in charge of a cultic set. And his tradition has it that he had a subset within there and he told them that the Messiah was coming in Israel. And he had these guys ready prepped because he calculated the rough time when Jesus was going to be born. He going into the... 69 weeks now and you've got all that stuff going on of prophecy but Daniel prophesied a lot of things and his tradition has it that he got these guys ready for when the Messiah was coming they'd have had things ready for him and we don't you wonder why a group of wise people turned up from a foreign land these magistrates were actually king makers and that's why Herod was kind of in a panic this wasn't two guys or three guys or four guys. We know there were at least two, because it says wise men, meaning more than one. They didn't just turn up with a backpack. They'd have turned up with a whole group of soldiers around them and, and servants. They, they put Jerusalem into a real frenzy, panic, because these guys had turned up. Why are they here? We're looking for him that's born king of the Jews. Do you think the king was happy about that? It's like somebody turning up and, where is he born who's going to run this nation? I don't know if trees are made, haven't killed, but maybe some of us would. You know, it's a case of these guys turn up to make somebody a king. And they eventually visited the house. And it's all prophesied in the Old Testament. But the verse I just want to really jump onto is verse 1, Matthew 1, 23. It says, look, the, the virgin will conceive and she will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. We all know the, the whole idea of the gospel. We know what's really going on. But the fact that God Almighty left heaven to come and spend time with us. But not only did he come to earth, live a life, die on a cross, was resurrected and ascended into heaven. He gave us the Holy Spirit, which is God with us. The Holy Spirit is still God. We know that, don't we? We're all right with that. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we're all God. And he left the Holy Spirit with us, but it started by this woman giving birth to this child and calling him Emmanuel, which means God with us. In Isaiah 7, verse 14, it says this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, the virgin will conceive, and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. We know it means God with us, God being with us. A couple of chapters later in Isaiah, Isaiah 9, 6, it says this, For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. <laughs> this is a trinity packed up, because the son, it says the son, a child will be born. Now there's lots of children being born throughout the world. But it says, to us, a son is given. We can miss it so easily. It wasn't just that a child was being born. It was that God was giving his own son. 
He was giving his son, and the government, the everlasting government, would be upon his shoulder. And he, that's his son, will be called Wonderful Counselor. I don't know, I thought the Holy Spirit was a counselor. Just a thought. Mighty God. Hang on a minute. I thought it was the son. Everlasting Father. Now we're getting into complications. How can the son be the counselor, the Holy Spirit, and Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace? Because he's God. Because God Almighty left heaven, came down to earth, so he could be with us. I mean, some people, you can, it's like at Christmas, you'll open your house up, and you might do what we do sometimes. We say, we're going to have an open house. And we put the invitation out to a group of people, and only a few turn up. It's kind of disappointing sometimes that only a few turn up. Sometimes it's like when we do things as a church, and I know I'm talking to the choir in a sense, but then some can't be bothered. It's like, what's going on? God gave his only son because mankind had tried to reach God ever since the fall of Adam and had tried reaching out. But at this point, man had almost given up on reaching out to God. As long as we're good enough. As long as we keep well, as long as we do certain things that are right, we'll be okay. And God knew that that wasn't good enough. It's not good enough in our life. This week, me and Joe went, um, went down to Meadowall. Uh, not to do any shopping, because I just don't do that. It's, it, my shopping is, if I want socks, I go in, get the socks and go out. I can't understand what's complicated about that. Why do we have to visit 12 shops when I know where my socks are in that shop and I know where they are and I'm going to get them? Why do I have to go to every shop and find out if they're two pence cheaper somewhere else and spend two hours looking? I mean, even the minimum wage you'd save more money just getting my socks and going. But that's my shopping. So we went to Medjool and we, bumped, we had some friends there that we were going to meet. They came up from Grantham and uh, so we're having a coffee in Costa. And I'm telling them about things we get up to here. It's an interesting character, this guy called Lee, he's, he's a pastor and he's working things through very similar to us and we're chatting and encouraging each other and he, he was talking about spiritual gifts and he wants to, his church to operate in them so I'm trying to encourage him with that and he says to us, how do you know if you're operating spiritual gifts? I said, well really, you'll know when you know. So then we're chatting about the goodness of God and the lady, I'm sat down um, Lydia's opposite me, Joe's outside me, Lee's diagonally across, and a lady at the next table says to us, because I've just mentioned about certain things going on in our church, and she said, I'd come to a church like that. So I said, oh, do you go to church? She says, no, I don't. I says, okay. I says, are you religious? She says, I'm, I'm spiritual. Oak. Where do you come from? She says, Barnsley. I thought, okay. Asian lady, she had a Sikh background. And so she's a Sikh lady married a, 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 a white English guy and uh, she was searching for things. So we chatted for a while. We chatted in a way and eventually I said, look, after talking to her about God and Christmas and what's coming up and telling her that she needs to get into the New Testament, read the Bible, I said, you know what, it, it doesn't matter you're searching, you need the one and only God to prove himself to you. You want to know that we call him Jesus. But he's also a wonderful counsellor, mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I'm telling her about God. I said, can we let these ladies pray for you? So Lydia's eyes are wide, looking like, oh, we're in Costa. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm in a cuppa. And we're talking about praying. So she said, yeah. And I said, but also, in my church, when we pray for people, we put our hands on the shoulders. Can these ladies put their hands on your shoulders? So she's like, yeah. So she's quite open. So the girls prayed, and me and, me and Lee were praying under his breast, and God started saying some things to me. So how do you go up to somebody and say, God says? I mean, that's when it really hits the road, doesn't it? When you talk to non-Christians. So the girls prayed, she's, she's thanking them, and then so I went around, sat opposite, and I said, I really believe God's got something else to say to you. I gave her a word from God, she's in tears about things of what I was saying. And she was so blown away that the God of heaven would love her. We told her a little bit about a Christmas story that he came, not only did he love her, he came. And he died on a cross so she could be saved. And there's no, she got saved, but what did happen is, she said, I'm off home to get it, to find a Bible. And I'm like going, I haven't got one on me. And she, she left, and we had a great time. 
And it is a season where people are open to God. People are... Afterwards, Lee went to me. That's what spiritual gifts, operating spiritual gifts, there goes, yes, I'm a lie about. <laughs> scary. But Jesus is. The Son will be given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called, the Son will be called, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. God is God, and sometimes we segregate him out and define him into boxes. But the Son is the Father, is the Spirit. The Spirit is the Son. Is the, they're all the same, but they have different... We can't get into Trinity now, I ain't got time. But it's the same God. Three aspects, three, three definite different characters, but the same. But the Son of God came to earth, and he came really because, as it said in Isaiah, we all like sheep have gone astray, and each of us has turned to our own ways. We've done our own things in Romans... A common verse that all have sinned and fallen short. We've fallen short. And in Romans 3.10 it says this. That it is written as it is written. There is no one righteous. Not even one. God had to come to earth because none of us. And I know I'm tell, talking to you guys. You know this is a good reminder. That none of us were righteous. None of us were right before God. None of us had a good standing. A right standing. Now some of you might be thinking well. I know you guys all know the answers to these questions, but some people think I'm good enough. Some people think they're well enough, they're okay, because they're not. I like what Psalm, uh, Psalm 14 says, verse 1 to 3. And uh, it says this, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And their corrupt their deeds are, their, they are corrupt, their deeds are vile. And no one who does, they are, there is no one that does good. But the Lord looks down from heaven on mankind. To see if there is any who understand, any that seek God. All, all have turned away, all have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. In God's eyes, nobody does good. Didn't in the Old Testament, one of the kings of Israel, it says that he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And when you track how he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, it's because it says he did not set his heart to seek God and did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And all the kings of Israel and Judah that sought after God, it says that they were like their father David. Their deeds were kind of irrelevant in the Old Testament, it was whether they sought God or did not seek God, which determined whether they were righteous or wicked. And you just think, wow, how did we miss that when it comes to even in the church today that we're told that you need to do good to get good from God. If you be good, you'll get good. But if you're bad, you get bad. Guys, I need to remind us that none of us can do anything good to get God to do anything good to us. Neither can we do anything bad to make God strike us. God's not in the business of striking people down. And I need to clarify that because later on next year I'm going to look at the sin that leads to death. And it's talking about believers that actually die because they're not walking in God's plan, but that's for another time. But God is not waiting with a two by four to smack us round the head when we step out of line. It's His goodness that leads us to repentance. It's His love that causes us to turn to Him. I was listening to, uh, yesterday or the day before about Joyce Meyer. I mean, most of you've probably heard of her, and most of you will know that Joyce often says that she was abused by her father. She was. She, she, and it went on for years. But the amazing thing is that she talked about how her father got saved. Because she would talk about forgiveness and she would talk about love. And God told her and David, her husband, to buy a mum and dad a house and move them closer. And she didn't want to do that, but she needed to care for them. So she moved them closer. Her dad wasn't a Christian. Her dad didn't even like Christians. In fact, her dad mocked Christians. But then a few years later, 
Mum phones her up and says, you need to come round, Joe. So she went down, round, and Dad had never said sorry. He was very proud. He never admitted to, to doing anything ever wrong. He never was wrong in anything. He never said sorry. And she said he said, so, he said sorry with tears and weeping, and she led him to the Lord, which is an amazing thing. But she said this. She said, my dad then said, I need to get baptised. And she went, yes, you do. And he went, will you baptise me? And inside, she says, something rose up. On the one side, dad was saved. But I don't, she thought, I'm not sure I want to baptise him. But she said, I made a decision there and there that I'm going to baptise him. Because forgiveness starts in the mind. And she said, all it did was bring to the fact that I had actually forgiven him so many years ago. And she baptised him. And she said, he came out of the wall praising God. Just praising God. And I've never heard that story from her. She often looks at just a negative and trying to encourage people to work through things. But there's a, in God, when you pray for people, you can actually see lives changed. You can see hearts changed. And guys, if we went around the room, probably every one of us have, are in or have been in or probably will go into a situation which is painful and hurtful and hard. But Jesus came from heaven to this earth to break the power of sin that's in this world on our lives. And he left us when he went back. He left us the Holy Spirit so the Holy Spirit can track with us and do life with us to help us through these situations. Remember that. The angel actually said to Joseph, um, she will bring forth a son and his name will be Jesus, or you shall give him the name Jesus, for he will save his people from sins. To the shepherds, the angel said, as they suddenly appeared in a multitude around them, praising God from heaven, they said, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth and goodwill towards men. Yeah. So they were saying there's going to be peace on earth. So one of them is, God's, Jesus is going to take away the sin, um, going to save the people from sin. There's going to be peace on earth. But I like what John the Baptist said later on. This is John the Baptist baptising people. You read this in the Gospel of John. And it says this, that the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I often picture that. I mean, imagine John. John's a bit of a wild man. Scruffy beard, hair everywhere. You know, a bit like me when I had hair. And um, he's eating locusts as an onion. He's got a bit of wool around him and a bit of leather belt and so on. He's kind of a bit of a, a maverick on the edge. I can't see him standing there with people going, Oh, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I think he'd have gone, Look! Everyone's, What? The Lamb of God! Who takes away the sin of the world? I think he'd have been shouting it. The angels proclaimed it at his birth. John shouted it, I believe, right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And God proclaimed it when he says, you know, this is my son who I love. With him I am well pleased. At the beginning and at the end of Jesus' ministry. That God was looking down and just wanting to be with people. Sorry. If that shook anybody up, I know it's Sunday and we're nearly Christmas. I could have done what I really wanted to do. I thought, pick the pulpit, ah, Jesus is here, throw it out. <laughs> <laughs> that scared some people, wasn't it? <laughs> Not going to that church ever again. It's rude down there. And the uh, thing is that sometimes, even as Christians, we find it hard in our lives to understand that we try to do good and something happens and we wonder, was my good good enough? And it's not about whether our good is good enough. Stuff happens, but we should still do good. But the problem always runs the other side of it. When we've done something that we know is not good and something bad happens and that little boy is because you've been judged for it or that's because of. And that's not true neither. Life's life. This week, you know, a little story is, um, I just... Caution names of um, somebody I'm related to, let's put it on that level, was in a flat with his friends and he overdosed. 
and his friends put him in a sleeping bag, dragged him down the stairs, left him outside in a doorway of the shop. Fortunately, somebody found him unconscious, phoned an ambulance, and they got sorted, and he's doing all right. Bad situation. But from that situation, I've been able to speak into a good number of people's lives from a situation. Stuff happens. And I don't think that when Jesus was born, it were all planned out what was going to happen, but it didn't change the fact that he, he came. We don't know what age he realised who he was. We don't know what age he, he really got the revelation, but he knew he was going to die on a cross. And I don't think that was the hard bit for Jesus. The fact that the sins of the world, no, let's put it this way, the fact that my sin was going to be put on him would have been more horrific and horrendous than the nails going through his hands. And your sin was put on him as well. Because my sin and your sin was the thing that made the father turn his head away from the son. Many of us can endure a lot of things when we look up and we see somebody going, come on, come on, you're doing all right. When we're going through our times and we look up and we go, Jesus is all, you can always find Jesus going, come on, just keep going, just keep going. A bit further, keep going. But imagine in a situation where Jesus looks up and the Father God turned his head away. Not because of the nails, not because of the whipping, but because of my sin on him. That's what this baby in Bethlehem came to do. And in that moment, darkness fell upon the earth. And he was all alone. But he was on his own so that we would never be on our own. The Father will never turn his face away from us. And if you are doing things that are not right... The Father is still watching you. Take that as a blessing or a curse, depends on which look at it. And when you're doing good, the Father is still watching you. But it's not changed. It doesn't look away because you've had all the... The only time the Father ever looked away is when my sin was put on Jesus. And my sin was paid for. All my sin was paid for. My sins of yesterday, my sins of today, my sins of tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, whenever, have all been paid from the cross. In fact, it wasn't just my sin that was paid for. It said he came to take away the sin of the world. So even the guy that does not get saved, Jesus still took his sins on that cross. Is he going to go to heaven? No, because he's not accepted what Jesus did on the cross. He turned his back, the person turned his back on Jesus. If you've got a Bible, if you want to just turn to Isaiah 53, and I'll probably get on to this tonight. Isaiah 53, verse 6 says, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own ways. Even as believers, sometimes we need to be careful that we don't turn to our own ways, to do our own things. Often we know what's right, but we don't do what's right. And it's not about doing right so God blesses us. God, we all need to grasp the fact that the law of God and the commands of Jesus are not there to beat us. They're there to give us parameters to walk in. Anybody who's brought children up or might bring children or looked after kids, you know, if there's a fire, there's a parameter. It might be a... A rail, it might be a guard, it might be just you shouting at them. There's a parameter, and God put parameters in His word for us to live by, not because He want to be a spoil spot, but because He loves us so much. There's reasons why God says don't do something, is because there's often a consequence because of doing that that will lead to harm. Sometimes, as, as young children, my two especially when we're younger, I said no to them and it was absolute. But no discussion, no negotiation, it was no. 
But as I've got older, I've explained the why to the no. Because they can comprehend it. And now I don't have to watch them all the time going, don't go near fire, don't go near fire, don't go near fire. Because they know, and I've explained, and in Ethan's case, as nearly got burnt, because he plays with fire, it's like his dad. And um, they know. And the Word of God explains not only the thing not to do, but it explains the why. But sometimes we fixate on the what not to do or what to do instead of going at the why. The reason why I encourage you to read the Word of God is because it's food for your spirit and food for your soul. And some of us wonder that when we're going to go into an hard time, why we feel empty and drained is because we're hungry. We're hungry for the Word of God. There's a story in, Jesus, in, in the Gospels where disciples tried to cast out a demon and it won't come out and the disciples asked later on, why can't we do it? And he says in one version, it says because this only comes out with prayer and fasting. He's not saying you need to pray and fast there and then, but living a life of prayer and fasting and reading the Word. Why didn't Jesus have problems dealing, have a problem dealing with problems? Because he would pray about things and then walk into it. But we often walk into it and then pray about it. Jesus often prayed before the problem came. So when it came, it wasn't a big problem. I often thank God all the time for supplying all my needs. And someone says to me, do you have any needs? I went, no. I said, why don't you have needs? I said, because I always thank God is supplying my needs. I don't wait for a need to pray about it. I pray about it, thanking him, but he's already supplying it. Because it said in the word, I will supply all your needs. So I believe that. Anyway, we're back. I might have to stop here. We've got communion to do. Part two will be tonight. Is that okay? No? Yeah. Are you coming? Are you not coming? I'm not playing. That's good. Yeah? No? Time of year when you why have we got no baubles on a tree roof? I could have thrown I could have thrown some baubles out at people, couldn't I? Oh. That's why she didn't put them on. Jean's not here neither, so that's why. Ian. That's sacky, but I can't. <laughs> read read Isaiah 53 when you get home and I'll probably look at it tonight. And it explains Jesus on the cross. But there's a key phrase in verse 10. It says, Yet the Lord's, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. It was God that sent his one and only son. It was God that allowed him to go to the cross. It was God that put him on the cross for me and for you. And then um, verse 11 after he has suffered in his soul because of my sin and yours, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge and righteous servants will justify many. And he will bear their iniquities. He will justify many. We read earlier that none are righteous, no, not one. But because of Jesus, we're righteous now. And in 2 Corinthians 5, yeah, it says, we are the righteous of God in Christ. We are the righteous of God in Christ. So as we come around the communion table now, remember, you already know. You know why we do this. I don't want to rush upstairs quickly and just give a nod for up there. Go on, Andy. Uh, Andrew. No, oh, over Andrew's good. You're Andy. Oh, do that for Monday. Andy, Andrew, for Monday. Uh, it's Christmas, something. <laughs> There's something inside you wanted to burst out. That's not tonight. Can't even have my sherry machine yet. Just don't tell the elder. Not yet. Jesus did everything he could. Everything we were needed for us. So we could have a friendship relationship with, with God Almighty. 
it says in the Bible that no one can see God and live. And yet we can come into his presence at any time because of what Jesus did on the cross. We are seated in heavenly realms because of what Jesus did on the cross. We've been sanctified, set free. We've, we've been saved continuously day by day. Our minds have been renewed because of what Jesus did on the cross. So I'm going to just say to you guys, come and just enjoy the thought of what Jesus has done on the cross. Because if you're focusing on your problems and circumstances, you can miss the fact that all our answers can be summed up in this table through the Word of God that can be summed up. And at the end of it all, He's done everything, so we don't have to do anything except accept everything he's done for us. Amen. This bed represents the body of Jesus broken for us, that we may be healed and have life to the full. And this juice represents his blood shed for you and for me, knowing that our sins have been washed and wiped away, and that we are now white as snow. And we can enter into the presence of the Holy God without fear and condemnation. Amen. So just come forward when you're ready.